I am just so excited to offer up our very first guest. And he's been called, this is one of the most interesting things I've ever heard, the Da Vinci detective. Because he looks at art and looks for things that mere mortals don't necessarily see. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mauricio Serracini. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Um, it's great to be here. What an honor to be invited. Um, I come from a very small city, but it was, has been very important in the past, Florence in Italy. And that's really not only where I grew up and I had this privilege, but where I guess I got the, what you can call it, the seeds, the roots, that got me this curiosity, this uh, desire to um, put together science and art, science and the past, science and cultural heritage. Something that I guess you have to be around you or you have to cultivate really because today uh, life not only is so complex but um, it really doesn't give you the time or the chance to look back and understand where we are coming from, understand that what is still very beautiful of our past, of our culture, and how important it is, especially for young kids, to create, to build up a cultural background. It will be helpful for whatever job, whatever activity, whatever would be their future, but would help them so much to understand themselves, because they understand their past, where they're coming from, but also they will understand better their neighbors and other people from other different cultures. So my job has been defined, I guess, otherwise probably I wouldn't be here, cool. If cool means to be passionate about it, yes, it is a cool job. But I would say I'm privileged to have uh, this, which I don't consider a job, I don't even consider a mission. I consider very um, a lot of fun, first of all, but there is more to it. It is a privilege because you are in contact with the mysteries of the past, with the creativity of the brightest mind of the most important artist of, our, of the past that gave us something to look at, to be inspired by. And um, this is really something that every day is new and every day is like challenging those great minds trying to understand how other very simple materials some colors a little bit of a egg yolk sometime uh, some oil a piece of wood piece of a uh, uh, canvas rather than a, uh, a mural they can make a masterpiece what is a masterpiece after all? How do you define it? How do you understand? And there is so much out there that still needs to be uncovered, to be appreciated, to be shown. But more important, it's important that we can interact with our past. We have to see museums. We have to see the culture heritage worldwide with different eyes. It's not boring to go to a museum if you can become you, the master of your discoveries, if you can interact with your cultural heritage. That is what science can do. And this is something, a little bit of, that I'd like to show you. Let's say, as I mentioned, uh, this is a very unique job to be to be doing something that it's so inspiring and yet it's so challenging. You can see there in 1984, I was working surrounded by 19 paintings by Raphael. Just imagine that just the, the, you know, I felt that was not only an honor, but it was, uh, I was really scared. I was, I didn't think I was able to understand how those masterpieces were created. And in the process, how many discoveries came out, never seen by human eyes before. Not because I have special eyes, 
but because I've used science, science that you can find used in many other fields, this time borrowed, taken, modified, and use it for these great discoveries. I work on the David. It's a big but also very important patient. Why do I say patient? Because when we look at our past, we look at objects, artifacts, they're very old. So they are very much decayed. They have a lot of problems of deterioration. But how do you define them? How do you understand them? How do you understand how to slow down that decay process? That's where science, real hard science, have to come in. Otherwise, there is no way to really help those masterpieces. And then uh, another one just recent, 2006, we had the privilege, because it is a privilege, but also is an exception, exceptionally important privilege to work with Leonardo Annunciation. And I brought a lot of uh, young engineers with me from the University of California, San Diego, where I've created a center of engineering sciences applied to cultural heritage for art, architecture, and archaeology. Now, let's suppose we go together to Florence and we see just one of the many masterpieces there, let's say a Raphael, a detail of a, one of the many paintings by Raphael that you can find in um, Florentine museums. This is what you will see. This is what we will all see. But just using very simple science in this case, look how much, uh, how much more is there to see. You might not like this. This is not exactly so cool, so appealing, but that is really what we are looking at, but we don't see it. Why we don't see it? Because we don't have the eyes to see what is called the ultraviolet color fluorescence. But all you need is sort of a similar light that you might use in a discotheque. And this time you shine it, not on a beautiful girl, but on a lady that has some centuries of age. And obviously, you will discover something that you know, is not so pleasant. But that is part of the decay. That is the aging process. And so you ought to see that. You ought to understand why that hab is so. And how can I help that lady? And this is how you see it now, one next to the other. Still, there's no trick here. Just flashing UV light, ultraviolet light, and then filtering appropriately, then that's how the kind of uh, image that you generate. Let's go and see another, you can call it curiosity, but it gives you an idea. This time we go to Rome, and we go and see one world-known masterpiece by Raphael, the lady with the unicorn. But this time, we focus on that small animal, the unicorn, and we want to take an x-ray. An x-ray of a painting? Yes, we can take an x-ray of a painting. We will not see bones, but I assure you that we'll see a lot of very interesting, fascinating things that otherwise, again, they are there. They, we would like to know, but there is no way to see them. So we take the x-ray of that painting, and what it comes under the unicorn? A poppy dog. <laughs> that poppy dog further studying the painting, it came out that not only Raphael did not paint the unicorn, did not paint the poppy dog, left the painting unfinished. Yet, you pick up an art history book, that is shown as a masterpiece by Raphael, the way it is, all the way down to the last detail. So, are they telling us lies? No. They're looking at what their eyes can show, can reveal. We just need science to really see the real picture. Let's see another masterpiece, the one we just recently studied. The first time was in 1981, and again I had the privilege to study in 2006 at the Uffizi in Florence. So this is probably the first painting done by himself, by Leonardo, alone, completely done by himself. That's at least what art historians are saying. And if we take an x-ray, it will take too long to explain to you that how many changes we, we can uncover, how many decay problems uh, also are there to be noticed, studied, and follow through. 
But like if we were to, to be CSI men, look, you see that rectangle? Now we're going to zoom in and see what it comes out. Something cool, you could say, fingerprints. Fingerprints that you do not see with your eyes. Why? Because they are under the layers of colors. So they are original fingerprints, not placed by anybody who might have handled in the last five centuries the painting. No, those are under. And I've studied other paintings by, Ref, by uh, Leonardo, and I found other, actually many other fingerprints. So maybe one day we could put all those fingerprints and do some C CSI cool stories about the past. Cold cases, that's what they call it, cold cases. <laughs> <clears throat> now let's move up to an incredible, beautifully, incredibly beautiful painting. Again by Leonardo, The Adoration of the Magi. We go to the Uffizi today, we look at this masterpiece, which is very big, the biggest painting, movable painting that's uh, on panel that has never been painted by uh, Leonardo. It was painted in 1478. It's a crucial moment of his creativity. And this is what you see. You'll say, OK, it doesn't look too colorful because it's monochrome. Uh, it's all this brownish stuff. But let's suppose now you can see, you can peer through all that monochrome brown layers of uh, colors. Well, I should say very few colors in this case. What is there else to be seen? I should mention to you that this painting, pick up any art history book, will tell you that it's considered a masterpiece unfinished by Leonardo. Well, science, at the end of the game, decided that was not exactly so. But first, let me show you just details of what you could see if you could magically remove all this monochrome paint, which, by the way, after six months of very, I should say, sophisticated um, investigations, it came out that that paint was never put up by Leonardo. But you mean that is not by Leonardo? You just said it's the, most, it's the biggest and you want probably uh, among the three most important paintings by Leonardo. Let's see what is underneath. Suddenly, you see a lot of figures, you see a lot of motions, you see a lot of animation. That is the underdrawing sketched by Leonardo that we finally can see after 500 years. There is no way to see it with the naked eyes, but that is all Leonardo. Let's see another example. Actually, let's take a detail. Um, but first, let me show you another part. Very cool again. I was very surprised when I saw this. Look, just a small detail. It's about this small. <laughs> there is an elephant there that you practically cannot see. What has to do an elephant there with an adoration scene? Well, at the end of, the, of this discovery, great discovery, just imagine you are with this work of art, you're using science, and suddenly it's like unveiling an incredible, beautiful, other mar masterpiece. This is not only an adoration. It came out as also uh, an epiphany. It's a story told in time and in space, not only of the moment of the adoration, but also the coming of the Magi. But this is also the biggest, most incredible collections of portraits ever discovered under a painting by, not only by Leonardo, but by any other artist that I've studied. Look yourself. And suddenly, all this becomes live after five centuries. And it's there for us to be appreciated. This is what Leonardo have le has left us. But we need the proper science to see it. Because somebody else later on painted over and made it impossible for us to uncover. See a detail of those faces. Each of one is a masterpiece on its own. 
I mean, the expression, the physiognomy, the movement, the feelings that each of those uh, faces express, it's amazing. This is Leonardo at work. This is not a, a drawing that has been transposed from a piece of paper over a panel. Is Leonardo at work creating directly over that panel? So it's incredibly important that we finally see this. Let me show you one more, just uh, to wrap up the concept. Why do we see all this? Well, there are a lot of uh, technology that we are using. We are using ultraviolet light. We are using what is called near infrared, middle infrared. We are using x-rays and many other wavelengths. Instrumentation that normally you will find used in the, in the industry, the medical field, uh, in the military, finally is directed to unveil the secrets of our past. What you see there is a collection of several images generated by different wavelengths. It's like dissecting the painting. It's like if the painting suddenly becomes a book that you turn a page one at a time and you see what is written at that depth. It's, a, it's an incredible world that unfolds before your eyes, thanks to proper science behind all this. And this is the way that we should use from now on in order to capture the genesis of the painting, the real making of this masterpiece, and not just being passive in front of a work of art, and be content just to look at what your eyes can see without even thinking that the surface cannot tell us the whole story. The whole story is behind. And science can reveal it. But the same we can do with buildings, believe it or not. Monumental building. Let's say a building that is five, six, ten centuries old. We want to go back in time. We want to see, really see with our eyes how that monument looked like at the very beginning and how it was modified through time. How do we do this? Look, suddenly we can see through plaster and we can see that wall as if we had stripped down everything. It's for real, it's not a joke. I show you, all we need is proper wavelength. In this case, a camera is called thermal camera which picks up heat coming from the object, or could be, well, it was created for Vietnam War in the, in the 60s, and that has been used extensively in the medical field, and then again the military ever since, as well as the industry. But in our case, we are picking up the little heat coming from walls, transforming the heat in an image, like a ghost thermal image projected over the surface of the plaster. Look, this is a... 16th century facade. I want to see what happened. If this is the real only facade, or there was a moment prior to this, and if so, what did it look like? So now we are able to see through and reconstruct and see all the windows, all the layers. You see every red arrow indicates one of the original windows of two centuries earlier, we actually create a page of art, of history of architecture, real, in real time, today. That's new pages of history of architecture. Hundreds of pages could be created this way. You could go in any historical center and generate an incredible visual history of the evolution of the masterpiece, but also that will tell you how that was made. Not only how it was transformed, and that's why so it's important, also from an engineering point of view, to know the materials, to see how they were used, to see the decay, so that you know how to intervene, how to restore it, but yet respecting the true meaning of conservation that is without damaging the real original idea. One more case, and then we'll move on to 
<coughs> the final part, my presentation. And this is uh, a building that you will see if you were with me in Piazza della Signoria, Signoria Square in Florence. It's a building about uh, the late uh, 18th century. And long before, way long before, there was a church. Is this church has been destroyed? Let's search for it. That's the thermal image that, is, uh, that was generated. Incidentally, you have to work by night, possibly when it's very cold, and so the temperature of the environment doesn't interfere with the little heat coming from the walls that you are examining. So it is, it is double cool. It's cool because it's beautiful, but it's also very cold uh, when you do that. <clears throat> well, look at yourself. You might not see something so straightforward, but those two arrows indicate slopes, like slopes of a roof, but also there is a, around that terrace, that window, the wall looks like broken. The profile of that window doesn't quite look normal. This is a painting, 18th century painting. And look yourself. Suddenly, the church that we were looking for, we found it, has been embedded, engulfed in the building that we just, uh, we just saw. And now we have the proof. And now, together with archival research, now we know that that church has never been destroyed, but let's say reused. Probably that's one way to say it. We are now involved in the search of the most important masterpiece by Leonardo. It's called the Battle of Anghiari. By far, the most important masterpiece ever done by Leonardo, far exceeding the Last Supper far exceeding Mona Lisa. At the time when Leonardo painted this mural, 1505, it was considered by the contemporaries the school of the world, the very top masterpiece ever conceived during early Renaissance by any other artist. It has disappeared for 500 years. We don't know where it is. Or I should say, we do know now where it is, and we are starting, in the next two months, the final stage to prove if it's still there. And where? In Palazzo Vecchio, just behind that beautiful building built in 1299, in this gigantic, wonderful, incredibly beautiful hall, the Hall of the 500, behind the long walls, which are supporting now the six murals painted by Vasari. Vasari was an architect that remodel the Hall of the 500. So first we had to understand what the Hall of the 500 looked like, and then finally understand where Leonardo could have painted. We found the original windows, the original hydro ceiling, the original uh, 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 staircase. And now we are ready to move on to the last phase. But first, let me give you just two more minutes of us. You can call it a trailer. A documentary was, uh, has been filmed about four years ago by Channel 4. And in a way, it's more captivating than my way of talking. But um, you also get an idea what really we are after. Please. Leonardo da Vinci one of the greatest minds to emerge from the Renaissance. He was responsible for some of the world's most beautiful and enduring works of art, like the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. But only 15 of his paintings survive today. Now a lone scientist is deploying an armory of new technology to probe the hidden secrets of two mysterious Leonardo masterpieces. The legendary Battle of Anghiari, admired by all Europe, but lost for the last 500 years to delve beneath layers of paint and varnish, and even through solid walls, to unlock the centuries-old secrets of Leonardo's work. His discoveries can sometimes prove highly controversial. 
It was a shocking revelation to find out that the colors were not by Leonardo. You are facing the test of your life. Serracini is the only real person to feature in Dan Brown's blockbuster novel, The Da Vinci Code. But his revelations are scientific fact, and he is now on the brink of unveiling extraordinary new findings about Leonardo. For us to accept Serracini's ideas, we would have to rethink exactly what Leonardo's early career is. <laughs> Uh, this is an absolute uh, bomb in the art history world. That is amazing. I thank you so much for your time and uh, the attention you gave me. It has been a great pleasure. one or two questions to you. And um, I'm really curious, what did you study to get you to this point? Um, I, first of all, way back then, uh, since I'm not exactly a kid, um, I graduated from the University of California, San Diego in 1973 in biomedical engineering. Huh. Then um, I got my master of the University of uh, Padova in uh, electric engineering. But my minor, when I was studying undergraduate, was in art history. And then I had one year of uh, school of architecture and three years of school of medicine. Then you steer everything. <laughs> and, uh, and probably you, it, it helps, it is not necessary, but it surely helps to be born in Florence, to be raised there. And, uh, Suddenly, you find yourself Were you surrounded by art anyway. Yes. Wow. But really, what I was mostly inspired by is to know more and more, to have to keep this curiosity, this uh, mind as open as possible. And the only way to do so is to keep exploring different fields, not to narrow your mind too much in just one field and being specialized just in that. And then uh, recently, out of the blue, it's, it's true. Uh, a Canadian university, McMaster, decided to honor me with an a honorary degree in uh, letters. So again, really, you steer everything, and uh, you get this kind of job. <laughs> and it's, a, it's, it's a, such a wonderful uh, work that I hope new generations will have the, the spark, the curiosity, to really pick it up. There is a great need of scientists to be specialized in this field if we want to have a hope to save not only our, ourselves, animals, the planet, but also our culture, our past. Okay. And given the fact that you've got this incredible diverse background, and you talked a lot about making sure that we look <coughs> back into our past in order to see what our future is, really interact with it. Correct. Why did you choose art, and not necessarily actually the scientific you know, piece, or even um, looking at history or literature? Well, if you want to develop the curiosity to the point to really understand what's, what is the reason, what is the cause, what is the effect of what is around you, sooner or later, like Leonardo can teach us, uh, you need science. Uh, but at the same time, you cannot address any issue related to us, related to the planet, if you are not embedded in a, in a cultural environment mm -hmm. and yourself have not built a cultural background. Because we are relating with people. We have to be open to uh, how other people uh, live, how, what is their history, their habits, as well as how we are able to accept and to understand others. That is, in my opinion, the prerequisite, not only to use science to understand our world, but also to understand our planet and to understand our neighbors, our, our uh, everybody, mm -hmm. frankly, and, um, and also to appreciate our past. And my last question, what, is, what are some practical applications of 
this kind of technology for now so that we can use it to help make the world a better place? Well, on one side, study engineering sciences. I didn't say just one field of engineering. Engineering science as a whole, together with uh, arts and humanities, and creating this new breed of scientists, uh, we need them by the thousands and thousands to be spread, to go everywhere, to defend, to understand, to conserve, to preserve our culture, our past, our world, uh, our you know, human artifacts. So there is uh, so much that needs to be done. There is so much that needs to be uncovered. And this is really, today, it's feasible. Finally, we have the technology. We have the know-how. And very often, I found that the technology that we are using, the way we are using it, so the methodology that we are applying, could very well then be uh, feedback to other, to other fields, such as medical field. We are analyzing layers of pigment that very often are just microns, and yet, we are able to generate images. One day, this will be possible for the human body as a whole. And that will be a breakthrough, a different way, a completely much higher way to understand our human body and the interaction between anatomy and pathology. So there is a lot there to be picked up. But my quest continues, as well as uh, my hopes that uh, young generations would very much uh, be captured by this incredible uh, way to interact with yourself, with the great minds of the past, and to be able, therefore, to uh, associate yourself to the present world and to see where we are going. I think art, humanities, and science should be one. Remember, there was a time when all this was granted. It was called the Renaissance. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you Thank very you. much.